Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 23rd, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we do some numbers that show the extent of the Alaska fiscal challenge why the legislature has resorted to bigger and bigger PFD cuts, and why that will continue without substitute revenues. Second, we explain why the U.S. District Court's recent decision in the Willow Project potentially creates some huge issues for Alaska. And third, we discuss some insight we gained into why some Democrats, who we would otherwise think would support the PFD, instead are pushing PFD cuts. And now, Let's join Michael. So, uh, Brad, you know, lots of stuff going on in the state, lots of big news, lots of bad news. Uh, yesterday, we saw that the uh, we saw that the the House Finance Committee was uh, was uh, you know put was 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 shut down and and canceled, uh, and now we're hearing that the House Committee is taking public testimony on the governor's bill today. For the 5050 PFD and whammy and APS scholarships and everything else, but there, I mean, there you could see kind of which way this is going. I I don't think that you're going to have a friendly reception here. I know in your weekly top three you've got some things to look at, and the first thing we're going to talk about is some numbers uh, to show the problems that we're actually facing, which I guess is uh, you know that's kind of important. It would be important to me if I was going over these things. What what say you? Well, it, since we're sort of waiting on House Finance to uh, uh, to proceed forward uh, on uh, on what they think, um, I, I decided to take another look, a different look uh, at uh, uh, how uh, the state's uh, fiscal situation uh, stacks up, um, and it's sort of enlightening to me. I the the the, the sources of revenue uh, that are supporting state spending. Um, have, have always been, or for the last 10 years, have been uh, in flux. Uh, oil prices have declined. Oil production has declined somewhat. Um, and so the, the contribution of, of oil revenues to support the state has, has been in decline. Uh, we've used, for the last 10 years, we've used uh, uh, savings uh, to supplement that largely. Uh, uh, and in, in recent years, we've started using PFD cuts uh, to supplement it uh, further. The, what I did was take a look at sources of revenue in the FY22 uh, budget, the budget that the legislature is working on now. And I was sort of shocked. Um, when you look at it in terms of, of traditional revenues, uh, the PFD or the POMV draw, the draw from the, the permanent fund earnings, um, and the use of savings, and then the PFD, PFD cut, how much the PFD cut is supporting uh, uh, the budget, uh, the, the percentages are, are, are pretty amazing. So the budget's about $4.5 billion. That's where they are now. Uh, traditional revenues are about $1.7 billion, plus or minus. That's about 37% uh, of the budget. So 30% of the budget is being supported by... Uh, uh, by traditional revenues. The POMV draw under current law, and, and remember current law is that uh, the, the, the draw from the PFD is limited to 5%, and then out of that comes the PFD. That's what the law actually says, although 
uh, uh, several want to ignore it, but the PFD comes out of that, and then what's remaining after uh, from the in the POMV draw after after taking out the PFD uh, is what uh, the current statutes would provide goes to state government. That's about um, after after the, the after uh, the PFD uh, the POMV draw that goes to government is about a half billion dollars. That's about 12%. Uh, they're using about uh, ha another half billion dollars, about 10% uh, to, from savings, a savings draw to support to the budget this year. But the remainder, the biggest chunk of the revenues that are supporting uh, the budget, uh, the FY22 budget, are coming from PFD cuts. And PFD cuts constitute 40%, 40% uh, of, the, of the revenue support uh, behind uh, behind the FY22 budget, this problem's been building uh, over time. Uh, in FY19, uh, the the PFD cuts were about 18% uh, of the uh, of the budget. That's the that's the last year of uh, the, the last Walker budget, the first Dunleavy budget. PFD cuts were about 17%. Last year, uh, PFD cuts were about 27%. So it's been building, but this year it's just taken, you know, a huge uh, 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 jump uh, to, you know, PFD cuts being 40 percent, 40 percent of the budget. So when 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 you when you think about how the legislature is thinking about dealing with the budget, if they don't have PFD cuts, if they don't make the PFD cuts and there aren't any substitute alternative revenues. If they don't make the PFD cuts, that's 40 percent of the budget. Uh, that's uh, that's all of a sudden uh, in a big gap, and we don't have savings to close that anymore. So they've they've we've gotten ourselves by not having by not cutting spending, and by not uh, uh, developing uh, alternative revenues, uh, we we've essentially gotten ourselves between a rock and a hard place. We don't right. have enough savings to to fund the gap anymore. Uh, we don't have substitute revenues to to use. Uh, to fund the gap, and they're sitting there with uh, with uh, uh, forty percent of the budget uh, now coming from PFD cuts. That's that's at an eleven hundred dollar PFD. If they try to if they try to increase the PFD, reduce the the amount of uh, of the PFD cuts, uh, that just that makes the problem bigger. I mean, you no longer are using forty percent. You've got this. You've got a gap that you've got to fill somehow. So it's a, a that number to me, uh, as I say, uh, it, if you look over the last four years, the problem's been building, but the leap to PFD cuts uh, uh, being 40% uh, explains, frankly, a lot to me in terms of in terms of what the what the legislature is facing. They don't really they put themselves in a position where they don't really have any place else to go. Right. Uh, drain savings, uh, no substitute revenues, and uh, and and they're just going to they. They put themselves in a position where they have to rely on PFDs to fill the gap. Well, and and I mean, I'm going to disagree with you here just a little bit where you said, you know, they, they, it's it's been building over years. Building over years, my God, Brad, it doubled in two years. I mean, the amount that the PFD draw uh, as, a, as a function of, of revenues for government, it I mean, literally from 19 to 22 or 20 to 22, it jumped up from 17 percent to 40 percent. I mean, that's. That's crazy. I mean, how you know what is going on with the size and scope of government that we can see these kind of things? And of course, we've seen traditional revenues drop and other things as well. But I mean, this is this is a mess. And and unless people are willing to address this, um, I mean, and and this is what they've been trying to avoid. I guess is what I'm saying this whole time. They don't want to look at this. They don't want to look at the corner that they painted themselves into, and we're left holding the bag, so to speak. Yeah, it's. I mean, government from FY19. What's going on is, um, is the a couple of things. One, traditional revenues haven't recovered uh, in the way that I think the Dunleavy administration hoped. Um, oil prices have gone up some, uh, but not enough to 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 provide any meaningful addition to. Uh, to uh, tr the traditional sources of revenues, and then frankly, part of the part of the issue is the size of the PFD has grown, uh, the statutory PFD has grown, uh, and that's shrinking the remainder of the of the permanent fund draw that's available for government. If you look at the at the by year chart, 
uh, you'll see that uh, the leftover, uh, the, PO, the, the portion of the POMV that goes to government uh, was a billion in FY20, a billion point two in FY21, and that's dropped by, uh, you know, down to 600 million. So it's dropped by a half a billion dollars between FY21 and FY22, and that's because of the of the increased size of the PFD uh, under the current statute. Th that that problem ameliorates somewhat uh, in, in in the future years. The PFD um, doesn't take that much of the doesn't take as much of the POMB going forward, but still takes a huge chunk. And so and so this problem just continues uh, out uh, out in the future. The, over, over this period of time, this, the size of government has actually dropped. I mean. FY19 was about 4.8 billion dollars in spending. Uh, this budget is, with counting the counting the vetoes, is about 4.5 billion. So it's dropped by about 300 million, but not nearly enough uh, to offset uh, the dependence uh, on on PFD cuts. Right. Uh, basically, what this says is, look, folks, um, if we don't cut spend, I mean, it's 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 another way of saying this. If we don't cut spending. And we don't have uh, alternative revenues. We don't have substitute revenues. PFD cuts, big PFD cuts, are going to continue because there's no other way to fill the gap um, uh, within the within the confines of current law. Right. So and before people, before somebody in the chat room loses their mind, you're saying that the portion taken from the POMV draw is a larger dividend. You're not saying that's a bad thing. You're saying that's just a function of the of the formula and that right. that is the people's money, but government needs to learn to live on less because of it. And it's just a function of the formula. You're not saying that it's bad, that it's larger and it's a larger portion of the draw. It just means that government needs to live within its means still and figure out, become more uh, flexible in its way of, of dealing with the revenue shortages. Correct. I mean, basically it's another way of saying the government hasn't contemplate, hasn't uh, uh, accounted for the fact that the portion of the POMV draw that goes to government is 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 shrinking over time, uh, as the PFD grows, that the POMV is shrinking over time, and 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 they're not, and government hasn't developed alternative revenues or cut spending uh, in a way that that accounts uh, for that shrinking. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I mean, these numbers show us one thing, Brad, and I think, I mean, this is where I'm at personally. It shows us that we continue to live outside of our means. Um, and I know you're saying that we have dropped government, and you could see that obviously with the ov overall spend has dropped down, you know, three or four hundred million dollars over the last four years. But the problem is, is that we're still not there yet. Yesterday, we had a discussion with Rob Myers, who talked about the size and growth of government since pre-oil. Since, you know, we, when we received that first royalty check in late 60s, you know, 69, uh, uh, we, you know, we were $142 million a year in state spending. That was the entirety of the state budget. And if you adjusted that for inflation and population growth and everything else, we should be somewhere down in the two, two point two billion dollar range and we're at the four billion dollar range. So we're still spending more because the money was there or the programs were grown. Um, but again, <clears throat> where's the political will to actually solve this problem? Yeah, we we we've we've increased we've increased the size and scope of government. We've increased spending during the flush uh, oil years, but now that the flush oil years are behind us, we haven't we haven't we haven't ramped down uh, spending again, and we've created all these. I mean, w w Alaska is almost a case study uh, in what happens when you create constituencies by government spending. We've created all these constituencies. Right. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it now in the last few weeks with the uh, with the whammy students. Uh, the, the whammy medical uh, uh, students with the higher education funds, uh, with uh, uh, the PCE, we've created all of these constituents out constituencies out there that are tied to government spending that go berserk when you know when their spending is uh, when their spending is threatened and say oh we can't we can't do that we can't you know cut our spending because you know students would have to pay a, a higher tuition. Uh, the medical students would have to pay higher tuition. The, the, the rural areas would have to, you know, pay higher energy costs. Um, but we don't have the revenues anymore uh, to support that. And so right. we've had to go to taxes in terms of PFD cuts uh, uh, because that's what, you know, that's what the legislature's chosen to do. 
and it's getting and the, and the portion that they're having to tax uh, is growing uh, larger and larger and larger. I, you know, it's <laughs> we, as long as we're disconnected, as long as we stay disconnected between spending on the one hand and all of the constituencies we've built up with spending and saying, you can't cut this. Um, and, and, you know, and, and on the other hand, on the revenue side, people saying, well, you know, we can't, we can't tax, we can't do income taxes or sales taxes or, or alternative taxes. We don't have savings left. And so the only, th the, the thing that's getting squeezed is the, is the PFD. Uh, and that's, and, and what this chart shows is not only is that going to continue, it's going to continue to grow uh, uh, over the, over the coming years uh, because there's no other, there's no other uh, influence coming in to, to uh, coming over the hill to, uh, to say. Well, I see that there's a bunch of commentary in the chat room talking about um, um, the oil and that the oil has been profitable. Conoco is buying up some of their own stock. They're being so profitable and everything else. But I'm sure Brad will address that in part with the Willow decision and everything else because – uh, that's a big part of what Conoco has been doing as well to decide whether or not they're going to try and stay the course on that. Yes, uh, Alaska has been profitable for Conoco. Uh, the question is, uh, would uh, would Conoco continue to make investments in here if we made it less profitable? They have alternatives. We've talked about the Concho uh, acquisition in, uh, in in past shows and how that's given Conoco another place uh, another place to go I mean there's going to be issues with willow we'll, we'll we'll talk about it in the segment once we get back uh, back on the air but there's going to be issues with willow and I don't think we should take it as a given that you know that we could you know tax double what we're doing for the oil industry now and still have uh, the investment uh, investment that, uh, that that we're going to have as you and I have talked about uh, or the investment that we want as you and I have talked about, um, I, th I think there's room. Others think there's room. The Dunleavy administration has proposed a way uh, to increase taxes uh, on the oil industry somewhat. But but thinking that uh, that the industry is going to it would have to more than double uh, the contribution that it's making now uh, to the to the to the revenue stream, thinking that the industry uh, is going to do that and not look at alternatives elsewhere, I think is uh, is wishful thinking. Well, and I would agree with that. I mean, I think that I think that there still is some money on the table, but you can't uh, penalize one industry overall and lay it all at their feet, uh, that there is money there. Uh, I think you and I have talked about, uh, you know, two, three hundred dollars, two hundred two, three hundred million dollars that may still be on the table. But that's not going to fix the overall gap of what we're talking about um uh you know in in total uh there's there's a lot more to it than just uh, even if you even if it was up to half a billion dollars there's still a lot more to it than that absolutely i mean the pfd cut uh in the fy21 budget or fy22 budget that we're looking at is 1.8 billion dollars that's and then we're and then we're still drawing even with that we're still drawing a half a billion dollars from savings so that's basically 2.3 billion dollars let's say and 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 right now the, the the traditional revenues produce about 1.6 billion dollars. So let's say we can up that to 2 billion dollars, or let's say we can up that to 2.1 billion dollars. That still leaves uh, about a 1.7, 1.8 billion dollar uh, revenue gap. We've just grown government. We've grown government way beyond our ability to finance it from the from the sources we've been using. Yep. Um, and and we're gonna we're gonna touch Alaskans in some way. The question is. What's the best way to uh, for them to contribute? Um, this is an interesting point. Willie just said, um, uh, Brad just made the best argument in the world on why income tax won't work. There's no amount of money that's ever going to stop them or fix the budget. Income taxes will only grow to include the poorest. We need just a sales tax out there that can't keep growing without pissing everyone off in the state equally. Um, but I mean, I, I think that's always been my biggest fear, Brad. And we, when we talk about taxes, I have no problem talking about taxes. My biggest fear in instituting the tax is that the appetite for revenue is there no matter what. It, you know, you talked about as if it will offset certain components of it. But, my, you know, it, to, to them, I don't think it's an either or. It's an either and. They continue to want to grow. And once they see a little bit of that revenue come in, they'll just want to suck up more of the gravy in the room. And, and I think that's always been my biggest fear. Well, I mean, so, so the way that the, 
the way we've talked about doing that is to constitutionalize the PFD so they can't come at the PFD anymore and to and to have a spending cap and to and to constrain the growth of government that way. If, if we if we keep going down, I mean, if we don't have substitute revenue sources, if we keep going down the road we're going on, all that's going to happen is they're going to continue to take it out of the PFD. They're going to continue to to cut the PFD as a, they have to. There's no other place to go if you don't have substitute revenue sources. Um, they're going to continue to cut the PFD and that and using the PFD as the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and on the overall Alaska economy. There are far better ways for the Alaska for Alaska families and for the and for the overall Alaska economy to raise revenue than PFD cuts. But if we don't have those substitutes, they're going to continue to use uh, uh, PFD cuts. So it's it's not it's not a question of can we get away from any revenues. Uh, uh, we've seen the lack of political will to cut spending. There will be revenues. The question is, what's the be what's the lowest impact way uh, to have those revenues? And by far, PFD cuts are the highest impact, highest adverse impact way to do it. So that leads us for a quick synopsis of number two before we go to break here. Uh, I mean, we're always hearing these projected revenues of these new projects that are coming online and how this new production and new projects are going to help save us and help offset it. I mean, the governor's basing on it, Ledge Finance is basing it on it. And then we got this bad news uh, last week on uh, the lar one of the largest new projects that's out there. Uh, let's quickly give me a 30 second synopsis of that. I'm out of time. Well, we've talked a lot about PICA over the last uh, uh, few uh, uh, few shows. Uh, that's always assumed that Willow, the Conoco Willow project, moves ahead. Now the Conoco Willow project uh, is uh, is is somewhat threatened, and we need to understand because of how much of our future is tied to Willow. Uh, we need to understand exactly what's going on going on with Willow, not only from an oil and gas side, but also from a side. All right, continuing now, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, number two of the weekly top three. We were just talking about Willow and how, you know, everybody's using the rosy projections of new oil fields that are coming online. Willow is always held up as one of the top ones that we're talking about, that somehow this will bring us out of our slump and save us in the future. And, of course, last week a federal judge uh, basically uh, submarined the entire Willow project at this point, saying that uh, all the analysis and everything else was inaccurate and and, uh, and not enough. And uh, that's put a screeching halt to what's been going on in Willow. I mean, it was already on a stay, but now it's been decided. Uh, what does this do for us in the future, Brad? Well, the, the judge's decision is that the, the environmental impact statement that underlies uh, the approval uh, for the federal approvals for Willow to go ahead was faulty, and it has to be uh, redone in uh, in significant respects. Um, Willow is is the project, as I said, going coming into this. We've talked a lot about Pika uh, in the in the last few weeks. Pika is sort of the second big project uh, that uh, that's sitting out there. There are two Willow and Pika, and we've talked about Pika being. Um, Sort of on the margin, uh, uh, the concerns I've had about uh, about whether PEAK is going to be ultimately be funded, but all of those discussions have always sort of assumed Willow's going to go ahead. Uh, now uh, the judge's decision uh, on Willow uh, uh, sort of puts uh, Willow uh, somewhat at risk. Now let me say let me say a couple of things quickly about this. One, Conoco in their past uh, discussions with investor analysts have have been very stable about Willow. Uh, they've said that they think they have the approvals they need. They're looking forward to going ahead and making final investment decision by the end of 2021. They're looking forward to going ahead and making the investments to develop window, Willow. Analysts have asked in the past, uh, in fact, asked last year, well, what happens if the if the environmental approvals um, uh, aren't aren't issued, or what what if there's problems with them? And Conoco has been very patient. Conoco told the investment analysts last year that, well, they've 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 hit these issues in Alaska before. Uh, Willow isn't going away. The rocks isn't aren't going away. The oil isn't going away. Conoco will continue to, with the process. Won't make final investment decision, but will continue with the process to get the necessary permits to uh, permit Willow to go ahead. So we have some some. Uh, 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 confidence that that Conoco, Conoco is not going to bail on Willow just because of of this decision. 
but it's going to take time. I mean, basically, the, the, the judge's decision says you have to go back and redo the EIS. That may, that may be appealed. Uh, if it's appealed uh, up to the Ninth Circuit, that, that, that's going to take time to, uh, to go through the appeal. Uh, if it goes back to the uh, Biden administration for reassessment to redo the EIS, if the decision is not made to appeal or the appeal is unsuccessful and it goes back to the Biden administration, that's going to take time. Uh, to redo the assessment, and it may come out, the approvals may come out differently uh, with more conditions and with more uh, bells and whistles uh, than, uh, than, than, it, than the Trump administration's uh, EIS came out with. Um, so there's, Conoco is going to be patient, but they're going to be patient to a point. Uh, and, and that point is when it looks like either the costs of Willow are going to go up significantly and make it less profitable than alternative investments elsewhere, or uh, it looks like uh, this is going to drag out for so long that Willow is in danger of being one of the stranded assets that we hear uh, a lot of discussion about as, as oil demand declines over time. Uh, there's going to be oil projects that, uh, that just don't get uh, just don't get funded, or 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 if funded, uh, don't uh, don't have the economics uh, because of uh, because of, of of the reduction in demand on oil. So um, there's, I mean, <laughs> one of the comments that one of the environmental attorneys made in the, in light of the district's court decision uh, was, uh, you know, we're we're just trying to stretch it out. We're we're trying to we're trying to you know, lengthen the process until uh, Conoco realizes this isn't a project uh, that they ought to be uh, that they ought to be pursuing and and go pursue other projects elsewhere or invest their money in in windmills or in solar panels uh, someplace like BP's doing. Um, and and so you you've got to be concerned about stretching it out. And the and the court's decision uh, was so fundamental in terms of it wasn't just a, a nick here and a nick there. It basically said the, the underlying EIS was just faulty and had to be redone. And so the court's decision is 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 sort of the the worst world that you, that you can have on this sort of decision because you've got to go back and redo uh, do a fairly uh, redo complete redo uh, of the analysis. Willow uh, going forward uh, means a lot to Alaska in terms of jobs, uh, in terms of oil production, in terms of uh, keeping production uh, in in, um, in in taps going forward. It is not as significant um, from a revenue standpoint as PICA, for example, because Willow's on in NPRA and the royalty uh, do uh, from Willow goes to goes through the federal government and essentially is targeted. The state share is targeted to uh, to communities um, on the North Slope. It doesn't come into the general fund, but the production taxes uh, are would would come to the state and they'll come to the state uh, in significant quantities over time uh, if uh, if uh, this project uh, would go forward. So it, it's it's meaningful from a from a financial standpoint standpoint. Uh, to this is meaningful from a job standpoint, meaning meaningful from an investment standpoint, meaningful from a from a revenue standpoint out in the future. The other thing is, I think if Willow is, has problems and 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 delays, that's just going to to multiply the problems with Pika, uh, because you, you, you know, success builds on success. You see Willow be successful, you see Willow get the permits that it needs, then P, then Pika uh, thinks the same. Yeah. All right. Well, that gives us a sneak peek at it. I remember the, the, the environmentalists doing the same thing to nuclear power plants where they basically challenge everything at the last minute on environmental aspects and they stop the thing and they basically kill the investment uh, and, and bankrupt the people who are constructing it because they're able to challenge that kind of stuff after the process has already been completed. It's, a, it's an old tactic, but they're, they're getting better at using it. Um, let's dive into the third discussion real quick here. Got a couple minutes. A panel discussion happened yesterday, giving us some insight into what the Democrats are trying to do and pushing for PFD cuts. Go. It, 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 I, I, I participated in a panel discussion yesterday that was sponsored by the Alaska Municipal League. Um, and there'll be a public version of it that will come out. It was a webinar that will, uh, that will ultimately be posted by the municipal league, but it was it was insightful. I was there basically to defend the PFD, 
um, and I did in the in the same fashion I do on this show. Uh, and some of the Democrats, uh, I, I've I've always been curious about why Democrats attack the PFD, why they want to why they want to cut the PFD, and it became fairly apparent during the course of the discussion that their concern is this. That, the P, that, that diverting the PFD is funding a bunch of social programs, Medicaid and others, uh, that, that produce jobs and produce benefits that they want to maintain. And the concern is that if they, if, they don't, if they aren't able to divert the PFD to doing that, if we have to go to if, – if we use alternative revenue measures like taxes, that people will, people will, will, will all of a sudden be more critical of those programs – uh, that that they're paying now now paying taxes to support, um, and 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 challenge those programs in a way that they don't think that that the defenders don't think they will be with PFD cuts. Basically, it's a it's the same version that what I've been saying, which is you know the top 20 percent is not engaged in spending cuts because they don't have to pay the costs. Is those costs are being shoved off on middle and lower income Alaska families, um, and 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 they're getting away with it in a way that they're afraid they won't be able to get away with it if we use taxes to uh, to, to fund government programs. So they're afraid, Brad, and, and let me, if I got the synopsis right, they're afraid that if uh, PFD cuts stop and people start to receive their full PFD and the revenue has to come from some other source, that they won't be able to justify their programs? Is that is that kind of what you're saying here, or am I, am I missing it? It's not. It's not. That they won't be able to justify them. They will justify them in the same way. It's that people will look at them. They're concerned that that people will look at them more critically. Uh, and the people they're concerned about is the top twenty percent, because the top twenty percent is the donor class. Because the donor class isn't having to pay for those programs now. By using PFD cuts, you've shoved the cost of middle and lower income. Uh, Alaska families and the top 20% is essentially having a free ride. So they're not using the top 20% is not the donor class isn't going to use its political capital to push back on those programs on the spending programs because they're not having to pay for it. It's not no skin off their teeth. Right. They're not going to waste they're not going to waste their political capital in that way. But if you use if you if you if you pay the full PFD and you have to use taxes to fund that 40% uh, of spending uh, uh, that we were talking about earlier, if you have to use taxes, their concern is that is that the 20%, the donor class, the ones that suddenly have to pay taxes, will start pushing back on on the spending programs. We'll start looking at them critically. We'll start analyzing whether they are a good use uh, uh, of money. And the concern is that that you know that pushback will will result in in cutting spending for those programs. I. It's it's the same thing I've talked about uh, uh, from from my standpoint, but it was I, I I've always had this difficulty about you know trying to figure out why Democrats are are keen on cutting the PFD, and and it was just blatantly apparent yesterday that 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 the reason is because they are concerned that it will put uh, put their programs in uh, in jeopardy. Rob Meyer says, or in other words, they want to maintain control over the money. The PFD, if it gets if it gets locked in the Constitution, removes the power from the government of being able to control those things. And specifically, as you point out, from those top 20 percentile, they don't want to have to justify it to those top 20 percentile. It's just easier to take the money from the PFD. Everybody's happy, politically speaking, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, everybody gets there. Everybody gets it. You get a new car. You get a new car. You get a new car. Everybody's happy except for uh, except for the people, of course, who are feeling the pinch. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, it, everybody's – and 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 the, and the other discussion yesterday that was fascinating was – their focus on on lower income families. It was basically they tried they, they basically were using the Sarah Rasmussen argument of government services benefit lower income families, and so it's okay if we cut the PFD because basically they're just paying for their own their own programs. Um, the the thing that the thing that nobody want nobody in that discussion really wanted to confront was PFD cuts affect middle income families. Uh, uh, as well, not as not as significantly as lower income families, but using PFD cuts to fund government still results in a middle income family, the the typical medical medical middle income family, uh, uh, losing five times as much uh, as a as a share of their income than the top five percent than a top five percent family, twelve times as much middle income families 
uh, contribute 12 times as much uh, as a top 1% uh, family. So it's not just it's not just lower income. It, we're not just having this debate because of lower income families, the impact on lower income families. We're having this debate because of the impact on 80% of Alaska families. Well, and so, again, and none of that addresses the actual impact on the economy of that money being, I mean, it's been sequestered. I mean, there's $7 billion in the earnings reserve account. That money could have been, you know, could have been floating around in the economy, actually being used, invested, spent, uh, instead, it's been sequestered away, so we're not even addressing the economic impacts of on the economy itself. Let, I mean, we're talking about the impacts on families directly, but not on the overall economy, which is the two-prong thing that Iser was talking about. Yep, exactly right. Um, it, it's, I mean, we're not talking about the impact on the on families, and we're not talking about the impact on the overall economy. Yeah, maybe next week we should have a discussion. <clears throat> I know that Barbara Haney put out a uh, a piece that I uh, saw this morning uh, in Must Read, talking about how uh, she's talking about how it shouldn't be an income tax and how distributional analysis should not play part of it uh, as well. And maybe uh, maybe you know maybe we should have a debate between the two of you and discuss it. It's silly to say distributional analysis don't doesn't have anything to do with with uh, with how you uh, with with how with with what fiscal structure you use. I mean, the very reason we're talking about PFD cuts, the, the 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 problem with PFD cuts is because of the adverse impact they have on middle and lower income Alaska families and through then the overall Alaska economy. That's distributional analysis. Uh, you're looking at you're looking at the impact of PFD cuts. So it's a uh, uh, distributional analysis is is fundamental. I w w what this what 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 her piece really is is, a, is sort of a side door attack uh, on income taxes, which have the lowest impact on on middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, by by disproportionately pushing the cost to uh, to upper uh, income families, and 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 people don't want to talk about distributional analysis because once you do, you realize uh, uh, what what income taxes what income taxes do. But it's but but the way to the way to have that argument is not to attack distributional analysis. Distributional analysis is absolutely fundamental. Uh, to determining what the uh, what the right uh, course is on uh, uh, on determining uh, 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 your your fiscal policy, determining how you raise uh, how you raise revenues. D Don Erdogan just commented, said distributional analysis are not economic analysis; they're political analysis. So that's true, but I mean, it, it all no, no, it's not true, Michael. You know, <laughs> it's not true. Distributional analysis is 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 economic analysis. You're looking at the impact on 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 by income bracket and you're looking at through them the impact on the overall economy the only way you do that is through economic analysis i mean i understand that people want to say i understand that you're that you're that you're trying to use a side door to attack an income tax i get that but that's but it's not the way to do it okay i mean we Distributional analysis is critical. All right, Brad. Uh, we'll obviously have to have more comments and more discussion on this in the future. Thank you for coming on board. As usual, I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. All right. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith, Lake Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.